Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or in the comments on our YouTube page during the program. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to explore President Kennedy's earlier years in depth with our distinguished speakers this evening. This is the first major work about President Kennedy in many years. We have been anticipating this for some time. Much of Professor Logoval's research took place in the Kennedy Library archives, and we are very pleased to learn more about this comprehensive new look at President Kennedy's formative years. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. We're so glad to welcome Frederick Logoval back to the Kennedy Library virtually. He is Lawrence D. Belfer Professor of International Affairs and Professor of History at Harvard University, a specialist on U.S. foreign relations history and modern international history. He is the author or editor of nine books, including Embers of War, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History, and the Francis Parkman Prize. JFK, Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956, is Fred's newest book. I'm also pleased to extend a warm welcome to George Packer, our moderator for this evening, a staff writer for The Atlantic, his nonfiction books include Our Man, Richard Holbrook, and The End of the American Century, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. The Unwinding, 30 Years of American Decline, which won a National Book Award. The Assassin's Gate, America in Iraq, and Blood of the Liberals. He is also the author of two novels and a play, and the editor of a two-volume edition of the essays of George Orwell. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Welcome, everybody. Um, I hear there's at least a couple hundred of you, which is fantastic. Uh, and it will be a, a privilege and a pleasure to talk to Fred Logoval tonight and to get our heads out of the present and out of the news for an hour or an hour and a half and into the past, which is a great refuge as well as a, a guide for us as we try to navigate one of the stormiest years in our lives. Um, Fred, I know you as the author of, I think, the two essential books on the Vietnam War. And it's not just me saying that. People I know who fought in Vietnam, who served in Vietnam, when I asked them, what are the books I have to read on the war, when I was researching my biography of Richard Holbrook, who served in Vietnam, said, oh, that's easy. Choosing War and Embers of War by the same guy, Frederick Logoval. So, I knew you as as a Vietnam expert, but now I know you really as something <laughs> broader, as as an America expert and as someone who just shares a lot of interest uh, with me in American history and foreign policy. So it's great to get to talk to you about your completely engrossing, um, ensorceling, which was the word that David Kennedy <laughs> used in the New York Times book review, new biography of uh, of JFK. Um, so welcome, Fred, and welcome to our audience. And I guess the first question is inevitable, but why another biography? There are, it's true there, haven't been, there hasn't been a major one in some time, but there are dozens. Um, it takes a little bit of chutzpah to wade into those waters where so many other writers have gone and where we thought we knew everything there was to know. So why did you take this on? Well, first off, George, tremendous to be with you uh, and to have this opportunity to talk with you about all this stuff. It occurred to me just now listening to you that in a way our two most recent books, mine and Our Man, are kind of bookends here because mine is really the beginning of the American century and yours is really more about the latter part of the American That's century, right. if in fact it's ended. Maybe we can talk about that. Um, yeah. But great to be on with you. Um, yeah, I think I've been fascinated by uh, John F. Kennedy and the Kennedys for a long time. I had written about Kennedy in other contexts, especially relating to the Cold War, and in particular, I think, Vietnam. And of course, in volume two, which is still to come, uh, 
that Vietnam question and the what I like to call the mother of all counterfactuals, namely what would he have done in Vietnam had he survived, will uh, get attention. So it's partly this interest in the Kennedys, partly a sense that um, this hit me one day walking in Harvard Yard that one could write a book that is a biography, but I could also use my training as a historian to and use Kennedy's life to tell the story, not just of his rise, but America's rise, that you could map the rise of the United States to, 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 to great power status, to superpower status on Jack Kennedy's life. He's born in 17, right as the US is entering World War I, hugely important uh, conflict, of course. He dies in 63, which is arguably the sort of zenith of American power in some ways, prior to the, to the, the mess of Vietnam. So it's those two things, and then maybe a third, George, which is that the materials in the library are just so phenomenal, and I knew this. Uh, the, the, the library that's hosting tonight's event, they're so good. I thought a lot of them hadn't really been tapped by a lot of people, so there was something kind of fresh about them. And then a sense that the biographies, as you say, they're out there, but nobody's really done, I think, uh, the kind of comprehensive life and times that I'm doing, trying to do here. And you knew about the materials in the library from your Vietnam research? Yeah, you I knew about it from, gone through. yeah. Yeah, I knew about it from the, from, the, from the work on Vietnam. I knew about it to some extent from other researchers, um, graduate students of mine and others who said, you know, incredible folders, files, documents in, in the library. Some of them used, a lot of them uh, haven't been used all that much. And then, of course, stuff has come available. Um, so, yeah, but it was partly because of my own prior, prior research, no question. So you actually zeroed in on documents that you already knew were there once you committed yourself to this project. Like you said, I'm going to file, you know, box 291, <laughs> folder 73, because I know what's there and no one has ever used it. Well, I mean, just obviously some of this, I, in, in terms of specific collections and specific folders, um, uh, I had to see them myself, see them up close right. uh, and before I had this sense. But I knew, for example, David Nassau's uh, terrific biography of, of Joe Sr. I was able, as historians, we all do this and you do this yourself, you, you look in the end notes and you look to see what other people have done. Yeah. I could see what David and uh, a few other people had done in terms of particular collections, some right. of which hadn't been, I think, open and available prior to that work. Um, uh, and then uh, one of the marvelous things about the library, even though I think a relatively small percentage of the library's collections um, have been digitized, nevertheless, some great stuff, George, you can, uh, anybody can access from their, from their couch. Uh, mm -hmm. There's stuff available that mean that, that you can see without having to darken the doorways of this library, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a great collection. So how did you approach um, the genre of biography? Since I don't think you'd written one, right? No. And it's not the same thing as um, the history of a war or the history of even two years uh, decision-making about a war. It's, it's more of a, um, I, I would say it's a little closer to the, the problems that confront a novelist because you have to fill your book with, with characters and especially with one character and bring that character to life. And I think all the harder if everyone already thinks they know that character. So how did you approach the, the genre, yeah. the, the unknown genre of biography and what, what models did you use or what, um, what guidance did you give yourself as you figured out how to research and write it? Well, it's it's so interesting, especially, you know, given that you've yourself authored novels. And so you have a sense of what you're describing here. That's totally fascinating to me. And you, I think you're quite right. History and biography are not the same thing. Uh, I think I've, I've come to realize just how different they are in some ways. Of course, of course, there are also important similarities. It's about, I think, finding evidence. It's about trying to figure out what happened. In this case, it's centered on a particular life, 
but you know there are similarities here between uh, this work and the work that I've done previously. But as you say, they're also they're also different. I think I think I had been fascinated by the Kennedys. It is in some ways the great American story. Um, this family, it's just a it's an extraordinary one. Beginning and I begin the book in the with the arrival of both the Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds in the middle part of the 19th century. Right. And then, of course, Joe, uh, Joe's rise in particular, that is to say, Joe Sr. And then um, this huge family, this marriage to Rose, Jack, who is a sickly child, emerges from this. Uh, and I won't say that I thought that the story would write itself. It turns out they never do. But I did think this has great um, potential for me as a historian, uh, but also as somebody who's interested in biography and um wants to see if I can make this work a kind of as I as I said uh, both a, telling two narratives at the same time both Kennedy's story and, and and America's story can I just briefly toss this back to you because you have this experience George mm -hmm. how would you answer your own question in terms of how you uh, approach this with respect to uh, to our man um I had a different problem which was uh, Richard Holbrook, by the time my book came out, was a, a fading figure in American foreign policy. He had kind of dominated yeah. uh, many rooms and many news events in his lifetime, but he was not on the scale of JFK, not close. He actually first went into the Foreign Service under JFK. It was yeah, that's right. his, his call to service that inspired Holbrook to join the Foreign Service. I felt that I needed to grab the reader with the first paragraph and never let that reader go or else I they would abandon the project because who cares? That was my great fear. Who cares? I, you didn't have that problem. People care about JFK. So I began my book about Holbrook in the voice of a novelist, even though the book has 35 pages of notes and it is accurate as I could possibly make it, it begins Holbrook, yes, I knew him, as if you're gonna, about to hear a long yarn by a raconteur who knew Holbrook. And that is the voice that carries the entire book. And it gave me a ton of freedom to do things that traditional biographies don't do, but always within the guidelines of the contract with the reader, which is that it all has to be true. So I, I tried to make it sound like just a great yarn that you would want to sit down and hear through a long and, night of storytelling. And I mean, we, you and I have talked a little bit about this before, but I think it succeeds just marvelously. When we were on Chris Leiden's show together, it was great right. fun to talk about this. There's one right. thing, if I may, that you say, yeah. I think in the early pages, which I've thought about and which would be fun to talk about a little bit. Uh, you, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I didn't have a chance to look at this mm -hmm. before the before we came on, but you say something like, only in fiction can we ever really get to know the person uh, deep inside. And I've thought about that because Jack Kennedy, many people think is, and maybe this is true, he's somewhat elusive. Some people warned me early on, you're never going to be able to really get close to this guy because of that nature that he had. He had some of his mother's emotional detachment yeah um i think you're you're so right in this and yet i hope my readers will have to tell me whether i'm right about this i think we do get i think i can get that's uh, given your um parameters that only in fiction can we ever really know um i i, I hope i get fairly close but. i think you do i think uh i i wrote this to you personally and i think it's sitting there on the book jacket now this brings us so close to JFK. It is really an intimate picture. Um, and we should talk about how you achieve that. But I think readers will find that this is engrossing. It's a page turner. And that's because you're always right there in the middle of a scene or very close to the characters. And his, yeah, there is, of course, he's ironic and detached and always observing his own life and everyone else. That's his character, but the the things that created that character, I didn't understand very well until I read your book. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that, but two things at once. Your book begins, or doesn't begin, but his story begins 
the month before we enter World War I. Um, and this is an interesting parallel to mine because Holbrook was born in 1941, which is that other year the American century began right. when we entered World War II. So yeah. tell me about your decision to frame JFK's life as a life of the American century beginning in 1917 and what that means for um, our understanding of America's rise to global power. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it might have been Ernest May, the great, the late great Harvard historian, uh, member of this department that I'm now in. I think it might have been Ernie who wrote, and this struck me at the time I was a graduate student, uh, something like this, which is, you know, we think of the American century beginning in 1940 or 41, or conceivably you could say maybe the late 30s. Um, some might say 1945, which I think would not be uh, correct. But Ernie said, uh, no, in fact, um, uh, America's contribution to the war in 1917 and 1918 was, was formidable. Uh, and because of the degree to which the European powers were decimated by that great conflagration, though it wasn't fully evident at the time, sagacious, uh, you know, far-sighted Europeans understood that it was only a matter of time before the, the Americans were going to be uh, dominant on the world stage. Um, and in a sense, in a sense, there was a delay, I think, in the in the in the 20s and 30s. The American statesmen uh, leaders were not quite sure what they wanted to do. I write a little bit about this in the book. Yeah. Do they want the responsibilities of leadership? Maybe not. Uh, but I still feel comfortable in saying that 1917 is absolutely critical to the American century for two reasons, U.S. entry into the war, and then, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution, which yeah. becomes so crucial later on and crucial to Jack Kennedy's uh, uh, life. And, so and, basically, and the, the Cold War that defined Kennedy's public life yeah. uh, began in 1917. The two powers of the Cold War their trajectory in collision with each other began in 1917. You could, you could certainly make that argument. I mean, I think that we would say, and I sometimes say to my students, I often ask them a question about when did the Cold War begin? And if you look at the characteristics of the Cold War, which I also have them do, then I say, how many of those characteristics were present in 1917? Mm. It turns out that maybe only a, two or three of them were. That is to say, one of them might be in a deep ideological schism, uh, uh, but some of the things that we associate with the Cold War, which is a, um, a um, uh, great arms race, for example, suppression of internal dissidents, some of that we see right after World War I also in the United States, and of course also in the Soviet Union, uh, a bipolar world structure as opposed to a multipolar world structure. Some of those things may not be present in 1917, but I've had very smart students, interesting students, make a pretty compelling case for 1917 as the as the start date of this mm. superpower confrontation. Did you have a preconception about JFK going into this? Did you have a picture of him that you were going to then draw? Or did you begin relatively agnostic uh, and come to your picture through the research? I think I think I had a sense it's a really interesting question. I think I had a sense even when I began from my work on uh, Indochina and the fact that he had visited in 1951. And, uh, Which is I, the beginning of Embers of War. And beginnings of em yeah. Embers of War yeah. when he goes and he asks all these penetrating questions about what the French are trying to achieve. I think I had a sense that the, the common view of young Jack Kennedy as a callow kind of playboy who had everything handed to him, who wasn't very serious about anything, um, and only later uh, uh, became a mature, striving politician. I had a sense that that was maybe not correct. Um, and I think that the research that I did, I mean, the, the, again, the materials in the library are so marvelous, I think show beyond a doubt that this is a guy uh, who from an early age is serious about policy, deeply curious about the world, um, so I mean, that's sort of a half answer. I guess it's suggesting I had a, uh, an inkling that I wanted to, mm -hmm. to, um, revise what was a common view. And I think that the research actually supports yeah. this. I this. think 
portrait. Some of the most riveting pages are uh, young Jack's trip to Europe in 1939, um, when Europe is uh, moving rapidly toward war. And <clears throat> he's having a mix of a kind of rich boy's uh, vacation, along with access to the most important councils of government all across the continent. Um, Churchill, <laughs> Chamberlain, Hitler. He he isn't doesn't he see Hitler give a speech? Uh, no, you know he to his regret he never did see him give a speech. He was there with Lem Billings first in thirty seven, and they had an opportunity to hear Hitler at Nuremberg, and they they decided now nah, let's not do it. it. And then they said we should have gone, but in thirty nine, nevertheless, as you say, I mean there's almost like a zealot kind of quality, the degree to which he shows up in these places that become hot spots. And I open the book, I open the, the preface with him in, in Berlin in late August of 39. And he even he even carries a message from the US uh, uh, consular official, the, the ambassador had left, but the senior diplomat in Berlin gives him a message to carry back to his father, who's the ambassador in Britain, Joe, Joe Kennedy Sr. And the message says, um, the Germans are gonna attack Poland within a week. Um, so yeah, you, you have this, 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 yeah. this kind of intrepid guy. He's certainly benefiting from his father's connections. He wouldn't be able to travel to these places and see yeah. these people. If Joe senior, who was already ambitious for his two sons in particular, the two eldest, eldest sons. Yeah. But it's also Joe's, uh, I'm sorry. It's also JFK's own early striving and motivation. Let's talk about his parents and his relation to them, because when I said earlier, I felt I understood his character much better from your book. It was really because of especially his relationship with his father. The, the relationship with his mother is distant. And um, I wouldn't be the first to say maybe the source of some of his um, misogyny because his mother let him down. She wasn't around for a lot of his childhood. Of course, his father wasn't either, but the mother was expected to be and the father was not. But his father comes across, Joe Kennedy comes across as, let's just say he made me feel like kind of a lame father because he's just <laughs> constantly yeah. arranging activities yeah. and events and every day is scheduled and we're going to go yachting in the morning and play football in the afternoon and then we'll discuss current events at dinner and you'll be reading at yeah. night. And he's incredibly, for a man of that generation, incredibly involved in his many children's lives and incredibly devoted to them. So so that seems to me to be the core relationship for Jack Kennedy growing up. Is that right? Yeah, I think it ultimately is. And I think you've described it really well. And I think it's an extraordinary aspect of Joe Kennedy Sr.'s um, persona. And there's a really interesting example of this, I think, George, which is that Joe Kennedy in, say, 1934-35 is heading up um, uh, uh, the SEC in Washington. He's heading up a, an, an important new government entity. And yet he pens these long letters, handwritten letters to Jack, who is in his last year at Choate, the prep school. He sends long letters handwritten to Joe Jr., who's already at Harvard, uh, the younger children. It just it strikes me that this is a guy who somehow managing important government policy is nevertheless instructing his children, uh, trying to mold his children, in particular the sons, he's more concerned, uh, it's, it's quite clear about them, and especially the two older ones. So whatever one might say about Joe Kennedy as a, as a businessman, as a, as a diplomat, he has an ultimately disastrous uh, turn uh, as ambassador to Britain, we can talk about that. This devotion to his kids is, is something. I'll also say that I think Rose Kennedy, the mother, she deserves more, in some ways, credit for Jack's uh, upbringing than she is sometimes given. I think he gets his historical sensibility more from her than from his father. He's actually more like his mother in many ways than he is like his father. Uh, his his international sensibility comes in part from her, I suggest in the book. Mm -hmm. But as you say, George, she's she's emotionally withdrawn. She leads a kind of separate life 
through all of his illnesses at Choate, um, at Canterbury, for his first prep school, then at Choate. Um, she never pays a visit. Uh, I think she comes once to Canterbury. She never comes to Choate. Meanwhile, she takes extended vacations by herself, including to Europe. Um, it's, um, it's uh, and I think that was hard for him, as I think you suggested. Uh, but but you, you also said at one point that what do you expect from a woman whose husband uh, is flagrantly cheating on her throughout their marriage and is humiliating her by bringing mistresses home for dinner. And of course she's going to withdraw. The alternative is to be fighting all the time and maybe to leave. And those are not alternatives that she wants to inflict on herself or her family and they go against her religion. So yeah. the, uh, the way out is emotional withdrawal. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. Uh, and I think, uh, I, I think that they, they, um, I suggest in the book that they have a kind of arrangement, which is that he's going to be more discreet uh, in his affairs than maybe he was early on, uh, and she's going to kind of look the other way. And I think that's uh, what happens. He has a he has a notorious uh, affair with Gloria Swanson in Hollywood, uh, and that's uh, I, I think on some level he comes to realize I can't continue to do this, uh, uh, but. You're so right, George, uh, when you think about what she has to endure and when you think about his view of uh, his, his uh, objectification, objectifying women, uh, seeing them as objects to be conquered, um, it's just a hard environment for her. Where did Jack's ambition come from? Because one thing that your book makes very clear is that it wasn't simply handed to him um, like, you know, uh, instructions on how to be a man by his father. He is his own boy and man in a way that is extremely attractive. He yeah. does not seem like um, a pampered, spoiled uh, son of privilege who um, went his father's way because that was the path of least resi resistance. In other words, he he's not Don Trump Jr. Um, he fights for his own uh, his own path, even while never causing too much trouble. Uh, you know, he he never openly is defiant and rebellious in a way that could deeply hurt his father, but he nonetheless manages to against a great deal of magnetism coming from his overbearing father find himself so how did how did that happen and how did it create a political ambition in jack yeah uh yeah i've thought a lot about that and of course in, in going through the materials which are so rich but all materials all archival materials all other kinds of evidence the oral history collection at the library which is magnificent you know they can't they can't reveal everything. I, I think I think what we see is somebody who, because he was bedridden a lot with his various ailments. Continuous. Uh, just, yeah, and continuous. Uh, yeah. He, he became the family reader. He devoured especially uh, European history and statecraft and diplomacy. Right. Uh, was an early, uh, he was an early fan, to say the least, of Winston Churchill. And I think the ambition at least comes in part from him realizing, hey, maybe I can do something similar here. Then he's also got his maternal grandfather, Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, who is a, a legendary Boston politician. And the two of them are extremely close. They're quite different as politicians. Jack is much more reserved, much yeah. more urbane, so we go, uh, yeah. more sort of scholarly in his approach than his grandfather. But I think there's also that, that Grandpa, Grandpa Fitz is, I can aspire to do something similar. And then finally, and I think this is especially in our own day and age, for me, such an appealing quality, George. He likes politics. And I think he likes politics precisely because he thinks politics matters. Politics is important. And I think from a pretty early age, before Joe Jr. is killed in the war, he is already thinking to himself and to a particular girlfriend that he was close to, Inga Arvad, right. that, you know, maybe I want to pursue a political career. Um, so it's, it's those things, at least in part, that I think bring in this serious quality to him early on. 
Yes, and it's not as though when Joe Jr. is killed um, over um, over England or over the the Channel, mm -hmm. suddenly it's it's up to Jack to carry on his father's dreams. Jack was headed that way already. I, I think that he was. Now and, and, and would have been, you know, he, Joe Jr. would not have had what Jack brought to that career, which is uh, that in incredible intelligence and, and broad learning, but also that that quality of being his own man, which is yeah. just so essential when you're in the Oval Office and your generals are all telling you that you need to start World War III with the Soviet Union over Cuba. <laughs> Yeah, over Cuba in '62. Well, no, sorry, I, ahead to Volume Two. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's right, and I do think that, um, you know, Joe Jr., who was the golden child, and who brought a lot to the table. He was, he was straight from central casting. He, in terms of being incredibly handsome, healthy as an as an ox, um, extremely extremely ambitious. Um, I'm not going to suggest. I don't say in the book that. Uh, even if Joe Jr. survives, comes back from the war, uh, that we would have seen the same kind of trajectory from his younger brother. Uh, yeah. But he had his own reasons for running. And as you suggest, I think he had a better claim. Uh, he had already authored a book, Why England Slept, which was a lightly revised version of his senior thesis. Right. That really yeah. rubbed, I think, Joe Jr. the wrong way because he was used to being, um, you know, primus inter pares in the, in the family. And, uh, he already had these attributes before uh, Joe Jr.'s uh, tragic death, uh, and he's making his own decisions, he, he, even even in terms of which office to seek in 1946. It's not his father's uh, decision to seek a house seat. That That is ultimately JFK's own. Tell us how his mind as a practitioner of statecraft, as someone who thinks about and eventually practices foreign policy uh, developed yeah. in those crucial years from the late 30s to um, the early Cold War when he first uh, ran for office. How, how did he become the Jack Kennedy that we now know as yeah. who was president? It seems to me those are the key years. Um, so tell, tell us what happened and how they affected him and bring in his father too, because that's a crucial it is parting of the ways. Uh, this was such an, a, a fun part of the, the, the whole writing experience for me. Uh, and, and my wife will tell you that I would, you know, I would talk about, again, what the materials in the library and elsewhere show about precisely this period. I think what happens is that he gets to Harvard, where the student, this is, he, he begins in 1936. He's had effectively a kind of gap year, so he's a year older than some of than most of his classmates uh, in the class of 1940. Student body is pretty heavily isolationist, and it continues to be so right up to the end. Uh, and I think he buys into that. His father becomes ambassador to Britain in 38, and is, uh, as you know, a, a kind of arch appeaser, uh, even more so than Chamberlain himself. And I think initially, Jack is inclined to agree with this position. But, and this is the distinction between him and his brother, Joe Jr., I think, is never comfortable outside his father's uh, shadow, and so he parrots his father really right to the end. And what's fascinating to me is to observe, little by little, Jack Kennedy uh, begin to see a more complex and crowded world than either his father or his older brother. Mm -hmm. to see the problems with a kind of narrow parochial nationalism that I think both of them endorse, to see the threat posed by uh, both the Japanese and the Germans, um, and by, hard to say exactly when, but certainly before Pearl Harbor, so let's say by the early part of 41, I think he's a confirmed internationalist. And that shift or that growth in his view, I think is totally interested. And then finally, I'll just say that his own war experience in the South Pacific in 43 uh, is important here in affirming for him, it's kind of mixed, it affirms for young Jack Kennedy that the United States has to play a leading role in, in world affairs. I think that question for him, for him has been settled. And for his mates, they have these long discussions in their tent uh, in, in the Solomons. 
about what the U.S. role should be. And I think he comes back from the war affirmed in that belief. But he also comes back skeptical about, I think, the military as an instrument of policy. I think you see in his letters home, which are really interesting, uh, a sense that, uh, you know, military, military leadership, it may not be a uh, contradiction in terms, but I think he's skeptical of that. I think we see, I'll, I'll see if I can develop this or if it, if it should be developed into both volume two, but you see it really in some ways through the end of his life. So it's, it's those two. Um, it's interesting because it may be, you know, he was, he was Lieutenant, right? He mm -hmm, was correct. Uh, yep. So he was a young officer, but he was not, um, someone for whom the war was in any way abstract because at headquarters he was out there obviously getting shot up because a whole generation of officers became the overconfident um generals of vietnam who yeah. thought that america had nothing to worry about with these yeah. peasants in black pajamas because we had fought the nazi war machine the japanese war machine this is actually going to be nothing. We are the United States. Jack Kennedy didn't come back from the Second World War with that kind of confidence in the American military. Maybe in, in American, in the American example to the world, but not in our ability to impose our will. And I have a feeling that's, it may have been the experience in the South Pacific, but it's also just his nature to be skeptical, yeah. to be yeah. to look at to sort of have a an eye on the darkness and on human frailty yeah. and um the flaws in our in our nature our blind spots our ability to deceive ourselves so all yeah. of that seems to be there at a very young age and i'm sure you'll be able to trace it um straight through to the the crucial years uh in in the white house yeah, I think I think that's so well put. I think partly because of his ailments, partly because of the tragedies that he uh, suffered, um, losing. Well, you, he effectively lost Rosemary uh, through a, a botched, uh, horrible lobotomy uh, in late '41. The the sister who's closest to him in age, they're only about eighteen months apart loses his brother in 44, la later loses his closest sibling, Kathleen or Kick. Yeah. But I think he had, and I think it goes to your point, um, he had a sense that life was fraught. Yeah. Uh, he had a well-developed well sense of irony, uh, a kind of self-deprecating humor. Uh, I think then combined with, as you say, the experience in the South Pacific, he came back, I think, with a sense that um, there were limits to what, certainly in, in military terms, there are limits to uh, American power, even though in 45, the United States is absolutely colossal in what it can do and achieve. Yeah, so I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. He didn't fall prey to what so many later generals fell prey to, and that's evident here early on. Before we get to the political chapters at the end of the book, yeah. um, let's talk about JFK and women because, man, there are a lot of women in this book. Um, they come and go quickly, most of them. Um, he is a hound dog. He's just constantly yeah. um, writing letters to his friends about having just bedded this nurse or yeah. failed to bed this nurse or and then there's just a ton of girlfriends that come and go and some of them he seems really smitten with and especially Inga Arvad um others are just clearly yeah. instruments for pleasure and maybe a, a bit of narcissism so how do you as a biographer yeah. uh, so you don't you don't spare him you definitely don't spare him but his treatment of women and the worst moment is when his wife, Jackie, has a miscarriage and he's off sailing around um, off the French Riviera, if I'm not mistaken, and finally gets back maybe a week or two later. It's it's pretty unforgivable. It's hard to yeah. want to stay with him. So how do you, how did you 
handle that fraught material, which you don't, you don't hold back, but somehow you make it possible for us to go on wanting to know the next chapter. Yeah, I think it's it's a challenge, George, uh, and it'll be. I think it'll be a bigger challenge, frankly, in volume two. Uh, I don't think, uh, as as a first uh, response, I don't think that the behavior in the period up through 1956 is predatory, if that's the right word here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there isn't the position of power. I guess there is already a power differential in the latter part of this. He's a senator and so forth. But uh, I, I suspect not having researched this fully and or, or written volume two, I think that this is going to become uh, more problematic in volume two. But it's already problematic. And I think, you know, some of this clearly comes from his father. I think we have ample evidence that he expected, indeed instructed his sons to proceed in the way that he did and to view women as objects to be conquered. There's no question about that. Uh, he was uh, unfaithful to Jackie before the wedding and after. Uh, and I think I can't have it both ways. I can't on the one hand say he's his own man in politics. He does not uh, uh, follow his father's dictates in terms of his political positions or which office to seek or which career to choose. He's his own man or whether to support isolationism versus interventionism before Pearl Harbor. Right. If I'm going to make that argument with respect to the political stuff and career stuff, then obviously he should show the, the ability to, to, to not follow his father's dictates when it comes to, to women. And he doesn't, uh, it's, it's, uh, Right. You know, it, it it doesn't have at least again, as far as I can see, some of the more problematic elements that we see with Joe with Joe Senior, who sometimes asks out, if you can imagine, Jack's girlfriends himself. Right. Uh, and um, uh, but um, but it's, nor it's, can we yeah nor can we say it was a different time back then because this is I think a more I would even use the word pathological. Um, attitude toward women's and I wonder at times I got a little whiff of if not hatred at least disdain um a dehumanizing eye toward them as if I don't need to treat you the way I would treat my gay friend Lem Billings to whom Jack after rejecting his advances is a loyal friend for the rest of their lives they, there, yeah. Other than his sister is different. She's like an honorary guy, but the, the <laughs> women don't get that treatment. And I wonder if there's something darker than just um, being a roué or being a, a bit of a, a scoundrel about yeah. it. Yeah, uh, it, it may be. I, I think that um, Inga, who we've talked about, is a kind of exception. Yeah. Um, because he treats her so differently from so many of the other uh, women. Uh, and um respects her intelligence and uh, in fact sort of is envious of the fact that she speaks so many languages she's been to so many places and she's clearly super sharp and they have these conversations some of them picked up by the fbi interesting right. story uh because she's under surveillance in which you see the two of them go go at it intellectually um, and in other ways too, but intellectually in a way that, that I think you're quite right. You don't see very often. There are some other exceptions. Ultimately, yeah. Jackie, um, uh, though there are lots of rocky moments and I deal with these, um, she is very formidable. Yeah. Uh, and he comes to see how intelligent she is. Uh, and she too has this kind of cultured quality that he, he really admires in part because he doesn't possess it the same way himself um but yeah there may be a certain how did you put it loathing or or Disdain. Yeah, there, yeah. there's there's something there that's problematic yeah. no question so he he becomes a, a member of the house from cambridge yes um and, and, or the 11th district it's 11th it's district yeah east um, boston and other watertown yeah. i guess a bunch of places um and then he gets elected to the senate um yeah. And all of it leads to this wonderful set piece that the book ends with, which is this 56 convention when Jack comes within a whisker of uh, being Adlai Stevenson's vice presidential candidate, which 
may have been a bullet dodged rather than an opportunity missed. But what do you make of Kennedy, the politician in those in those years? What do, what what did you learn about him and what struck you as um, he doesn't seem presidential material in the early going. He no. seems uh, hardworking, curious, all that, but it, it there isn't that quality that you that that you just immediately say this guy's going to go to the top, and yet obviously he's going to get to the top. So what? How do you describe him as a politician uh, who saw domestic politics as? what was the word sewer contracts <laughs> uh, really is mainly interested in world affairs. Yeah, no, and I think that's right. I think it's yeah. pretty clear from the time he, he enters the house in 47 uh, that uh, foreign policy is where he's most interested. It's yeah. also where I think he feels the most comfortable during the campaign in 46, you know, this skinny 29 year old uh, who's got to get the nomination. Once he gets the nomination, he's home free, but that nomination battle is a ferocious one. Yeah. And you see even then that he's comfortable talking about the emerging Cold War, uh, then yet not really a reality, but it's emerging, uh, and other international issues. Um, and by the way, quite um, already penetrating, insightful in seeing uh, things from the Soviet perspective and what they might want. There's a certain empathetic understanding that he has with respect to policy that I think is impressive. But then, as you say, it doesn't have the same kind of engagement at all with domestic issues. Right. I think he's, uh, I think he's fundamentally uh, liberal on uh, most issues, not so much fiscal issues where he's more conservative. Uh, he's quite conservative on foreign policy. This is a, he's, I, as I suggest in the book that he's an early cold warrior. Yeah. That he does not see an opportunity for accommodation when, when, um, when Henry Wallace argues for the need to try to, to smooth things over with the Soviets. Um, JFK is pretty caustic in, in, in swatting down that notion. Interestingly here, just a side note, Joe Kennedy Sr. And I think David Nassau brings this out in his biography. And maybe Arthur Schlesinger Jr. back in the day brought this out, that Joe Kennedy articulated a position that more than a few Cold War historians would articulate, which is the Soviets aren't going to invade anybody. The Soviets are not a threat to uh, uh, the United States in terms of its existential existence. Mm -hmm. We can take a sort of hands-off approach here. That's Joe Ken Kennedy Sr. Yeah. His son felt very differently at the time, uh, which is a fascinating well, difference between the two of them. An interesting instance of that, he goes to Vietnam, as you say, in 1951, and this is the opening of your wonderful book, Embers of War, and asks all the right questions and wants to see for himself. And what he sees is that the French are fighting a losing yeah. colonialist war. And why should that be our war? That what is, why are we defending a colonial empire? We're the world's hope for democracy. But by the mid fifties, he is taking a more hawkish view about Vietnam as a, yep. um, as a threat, giving speeches in which he thinks we really have to hold the line against communism uh, right there at the uh, parallel between North and South Vietnam. So what happened? How did- I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's the great paradox about JFK and Indochina, I think, which is, uh, and, and I think this will be the, the thread in volume two as well, mm -hmm. is that I don't think his skepticism, George, about a military solution in Vietnam ever goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's there from 51. It's there until November of 63. And in fact, we have lots of evidence uh, of him in the White House uh, rejecting uh, hawkish advice from his aides when they want to send ground troops and so on. And it's one of the reasons why, in terms of the what if, uh, though we can never know, uh, I do believe he would have, if he had survived, he would have avoided, it's most likely that he would have avoided the kind of huge open-ended escalation that Johnson- uh, Well, that's, in, the, that's in the part choosing war. And that, that's a passage in choosing war that I read really mm. carefully because you had earned the right to say that. <laughs> but I'll be curious to see if you still think it- I, I, and yeah, after I, writing volume two, but anyway, go ahead. I, I reserve the right to, to, to shift. No, but the paradox then, so if that's part of this, the 
The paradox is that, as you say, this same Jack Kennedy, as we get into even the mid-50s, but especially the late 50s, is much more uh, aggressive. He's careful, because he's a very careful politician. He's careful in terms of his language, a very reasoned approach to all policy issues. But, as you say, he now sings a different tune on Vietnam and on Indochina, and he's supportive of the ZM government in the South. He believes that the United States must preserve, uh, do all in its power to preserve a non-communist South Vietnam. And so figuring out how this guy who understood so early that Western powers, whether it be France or the United States, and he said that, he said any Western power is probably not gonna be able to put down Ho Chi Minh's revolution. Yeah. Is this the same guy who's uh, in domestic political terms? And maybe that's the explanation. He seeks the White House now. And yeah. he knows that Democrats cannot be uh, targeted with the soft on communism um, uh, uh, slogan. Maybe that's the explanation of the paradox. But however yeah. we explain it, it's, it's there on Vietnam. And it's going to be a major tension of volume two, because even though I think you convinced me that if Kennedy had lived, we would not have had uh, 200,000 troops in Vietnam within two years of his, you know, of, of 63. Nonetheless, he got us in deep. He brought in 15,000 advisors and he overthrew the government of South Vietnam. So yep. in some ways, um, he, he may well have corrected his own mistakes, but the mistakes were already being made. And, and how much domestic politics has to do with that, the fear of a democratic president faced with uh, hawks in his own government and the opposition party. I, I'll be really interested to see what you learn doing volume two. We're gonna get, take questions in about five minutes, but I just had one or two more things I wanted to ask you. The only points in your book that I stumbled at all were the same two that David Kennedy mentions in his glowing, wonderful review uh, in this week's New York Times book review. And those are the McCarthy period and the question of authorship of profiles in Courage. And you've looked at both of them carefully. So tell us why I might be wrong in thinking that JFK deserves more of a harder spanking for his punting, essentially the McCarthy era and trying his hardest not to have to uh, make a difficult call on that. And why we shouldn't think that he may have written some notes for Profiles in Courage, but um, he, d he didn't write the book uh, page, page for page. So take each of those, please. Um. Yeah, I don't know whether the, the first part of this is something I should be admitting before a, a live audience, as it were. But when you read this, George, in uh, more than in draft, it was, I guess, in galley form. In galley. Uh, and you pointed out the McCarthy bit. Uh, I said, I need to tweak this a little bit. I need to try to somehow address this. Is there time? Mm. And the people at Random House who are absolutely marvelous up and down the line. I have such a wonderful publisher. But they said, yeah, we can do this. So in response, not, I think, to your satisfaction, although you will see. No, that. because I you're have. You're going to be getting the. I the haven't things. gotten the finished yeah. book, so yeah, you may well have just killed and, this book. Um, you know? it, it's, it's because of how late we were. I could only do a few words, right? change a few sentences. But suffice it to say that I think you were right. I, I do think that even before your intervention, I suggested that uh, he was um, overly careful on McCarthy. I think it had something to do with the close family ties with McCarthy, mm -hmm. especially with Joe Sr., who, who loved. But Bobby, we haven't talked about Bobby tonight yet. Bobby yeah. was also close to McCarthy and would remain close. Uh, flew to Wisconsin for McCarthy's funeral. Uh, remained devoted to him, I think, in some ways to the end. Uh, it's partly about Massachusetts politics. Irish Catholics constitute a, uh, constitute a large part of the electorate. And by the way, interesting comparison to our own day. Mm. Right through to the end, beyond the censure, or at least through the censure in 54 of Joe McCarthy, uh, 
public opinion survey after public and uh, opinion survey showed that he had the support of roughly 40% of the electorate. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to draw the, the comparison too closely, but it's interesting how even after the Senate begins to move, even after his uh, attack on the army, McCarthy, a lot of Americans stay with him to, to the end. Uh, but I think Jack Kennedy would have spared himself a lot of grief if he had uh, instructed Sorensen. He was in the hospital for legitimate reasons. So those authors who say, well, he went into the hospital to dodge the, the McCarthy uh, vote, I, I think that's not true. But he could have, through a procedure called pairing, he could have instructed Sorensen to vote, and he should have done so. Um, and yeah. why he didn't uh, is interesting. Here's another quick little thing about this, which is that in 56, at the aforementioned Democratic National Convention, he had a meeting with Eleanor Roosevelt. And Mr. Roosevelt basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, what gives? Why didn't you come out against McCarthy? And what I puzzle over, George, maybe you have an explanation for this. I don't write about this in the book. I thought about it. I think I had a paragraph and I then erased it. But I thought, why would he not, in the summer of 56, when attacking Joe McCarthy is easy, the guy's a spent force, he's gone, why would Jack Kennedy not say to Mrs. Roosevelt, yeah, you know what? I didn't like the guy, which is true. I don't think he ever liked McCarthy in personal terms or even in political terms. Uh, even then, however, he doesn't want to criticize McCarthy, and I can't quite figure that out. Let it's me quickly respond. To I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I can only imagine that he was loyal to his family, and this yeah. was one that didn't mean enough to him yeah. as uh, going against his father's impeachment did yeah. to, um, to reject his father that way, I think. Uh, and that's I mean, as good an explanation as any of them. For me, this, my parents were uh, a little younger than JFK, and the McCarthy period was the litmus test for them yeah. as liberal Democrats of whether a politician um, could be trusted, whether they yeah. could really respect a politician. And they ended up as Stevenson people, largely because I think Stevenson was much more outspoken about McCarthy. He was, he was. I will and, only say, yeah. go ahead, sorry. And so when it came to 1960, they celebrated Kennedy's election, but they, he was not their man and he never was their man. And it was really yeah. because of the McCarthy period. I think for a lot of liberals that yeah. remained true. So I think it had a decisive effect not so much on the politics of that time, but on how Democrats saw him and how they yeah. divided on him. I think it's a really good point. I'll just say one other thing there quickly and then just talk for a minute about yeah. profile courage. And that is that it is worth noting that the, Democrat, the Democratic Party as a whole, including liberal stalwarts like Hubert Humphrey, for a very long time were unwilling to criticize McCarthy. Yeah. You have to go pretty far into 54 to see broad parts of the party uh, begin to uh, go after him in any serious way. So Kennedy is not alone in this regard. And in fact, Leverett Saltonstall, um, senior senator from, from Massachusetts, Republican, is just as cautious, if not more so, yeah. than Jack Kennedy. So he's, he's not alone in this regard. Absolutely. The censure vote is the problem. Now, on Profiles and Courage, very quickly, so we can open this up for, yeah. for others. Um, yeah, I guess here you and I differ a little bit. I think that um, I think that the evidence is pretty powerful that the broad architecture of the book, the themes of the book, mm -hmm. the argument, which, by the way, I think has salience in our own day, in part about the need for evidence-based discourse, mm -hmm. for bargaining in good faith, the need ultimately for compromise in a democracy, which we, we can discuss. But those arguments those themes are jack kennedy's ted Sorensen is way too young to have at 25 mm -hmm. or 26 he's not going to be able to articulate those kinds of themes right. and he didn't um moreover the introduction and the conclusion i think for me the most interesting and important parts of the book i think uh, those are more than kennedy's notes i think that's basically his work had this had he not won the pulitzer I don't think this would have ever been an issue. No. And the question I, which I'm going to deal with, so I can come back to this. Yeah. Uh, 
how he should have responded to the awarding of the Pulitzer is a, is a, is a, is a fair question. It was the, one of the proudest moments of his life, he later said. Um, is it reasonable to expect him to turn down the award? I don't know. Uh, I don't know what that would have meant to an aspiring politician. Um, uh, there's no question that the middle chapters were drafted by others, uh, mm -hmm. not just Sorensen, but they had some professors who helped them, and I write about this. Yeah. But I guess I'm suggesting this is more Jack Kennedy's book than perhaps you are yeah. allowing. Well, before we go to questions, I don't want to end on that minor disagreement because I want our audience to know that we haven't even really talked about the way the book ends, but it's a marvelous account of a convention that hasn't gone down in history as one of the great conventions, but it's the, the 56th Democratic Convention. And you see Jack Kennedy at his absolute best because he is maneuvering and showing that he knows how to play the game, but he's also detached enough to be able to recognize that he can take a loss now and it won't be the end of him. And in fact, it might actually help him um, when the big turn comes four years yeah, from. I think that's that. right. And I'll just say here to, to folks that, and I, I have this in one of the end notes, you can go on YouTube, which I guess where we, is where we're on now, and you can see the concession speech that he gives at that convention. Uh, and it's done without notes. Uh, I think it's a remarkable moment captured mm -hmm. uh, there. We can all see it on YouTube. Uh, it's an amazing clip. So if, if, if folks are interested in this and he's come so close just minutes before to getting this nomination. By the way, his father thinks it's a disaster to even seek the nomination. Yes. He comes this close. Uh, and then he says to Ted Sorensen, when it becomes clear that the tide has turned, he says, let's go. And they leave their hotel room. They go to the podium. He gives this speech. Uh, uh, and it's, it's an amazing moment. Yeah. And a great ending. And it makes you eager to, for Fred Logeval to, to get to volume two and finish volume two. <laughs> so, um, let's get to a few questions. And some of them are questions that I would have wanted to ask. So I'll allow others to ask them. What were, um, this comes from someone in Colombia. How would you define his leadership style and how does it apply to today's world challenges? You touched on that briefly, Fred. What more do you have to say about that? Um, well, I think it's a leadership style characterized by a, an absolute um, insistent on his part that he himself and his aides need to be well informed on the issues. He had very little patience for advisors and others who didn't know their stuff down to the details. So it's, 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 a, uh, it's, it's a leadership style that is about becoming informed on an issue uh, and, and then acting accordingly, which leads me to the second point. I think he yeah. is, and this is something I find admirable, he, is, he's not, he doesn't want yes men and yes women around him. Uh, he is actually somebody who wants uh, people to have different views. Uh, he wants to hear people's opinions about which path to take, uh, and then he will act accordingly. And I'll also say maybe there's much more to be said about this, but the final piece of this maybe is that, you know, when uh, he needs to make a decision, even though he's overly cautious on issues like civil rights, which we can discuss, uh, his legislative record overall is fairly meager, uh, yeah. by the time he's killed at the Cuban Missile Crisis, when virtually all of his advisors are counseling a military response. Uh, they are aggressive, almost to a person. Um, Kennedy is seeking a political solution. Uh, he shows, wow. an, uh, he shows a, an, a capacity to look at things from Khrushchev's perspective, which I think is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an element of his leadership style too. Yeah. Um, this question is, um, why did you end in 56? Are you really going to be able to get all of the late 50s, the 19th <laughs> election and his entire presidency into volume two? So that's I, a worried reader about your next book. I'm going to remember that question. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, whoever posed it, uh, that one will be seared in my uh, memory. No, I, I'm, I'm committed to doing this. I, I think I can do it. 
you know, it's seven years of his life. And of course, so much happens in those seven years. Yeah. But, you know, the first volume, uh, there's a lot also that happens. It's an, it's an extraordinarily varied life that he leads, which helps me as a, a biographer. The story is remarkable. And there's so much in the early volume also on his father. Uh, he's himself a, 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 a huge figure in the book and, and several others. But I, I think the subtext of your question is a good one. I've got to deal with the amazing campaign, which really begins, by the way, in 57, a secret of Jack Kennedy's success at all levels of politics is that he starts earlier than the competition and he mm -hmm. works harder than the competition. Mm -hmm. So I have to early in volume two deal with this, you know, flying around the country with Ted Sorensen and, and speaking before tiny audiences on airport tarmacs for, you know, eight people and 12 people. And then of course, ultimately it culminates in the uh, first, the, the primary battle in 60, then the race against Nixon. And we haven't even gotten yet to the presidency. Yeah. I guess I'm helped by the fact, it's a terrible thing to say, but this all ends really suddenly in, in yeah. November of 1963. Uh, and um, I don't think, George, my present plan is not to get deep into the conspiracies or to deep into the, uh, obviously I have to give the reader my view of what happened in Dallas, Yeah. but maybe I save some space by keeping that pretty limited. Yeah, well, I mean, I have the same fear <clears throat> for Robert Caro, except yeah. he's older than you. And he has, in some ways, he, even more grand. I mean, between 64 and 68, Lyndon Johnson's presidency went to the to the stars and then crashed back to Earth. So I don't know how he's going to do it, but I hope it happens soon. Yeah, we all um, we all do. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So a, a viewer asks, what legends about young JFK do you either unwind or upend? Uh, from the biography? Are, are there any stories that you either could prove wrong or that you learned and, and included that we don't know? Or what what is there hidden deep in the, in the archives um, that might raise our eyebrows or teach us something about young JFK? I mean, part of it is what we've already discussed. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe the viewers is wanting something more specific, but I do think uh, that this is a uh, young JFK who uh, is one of this is one of his best qualities, by the way. And Jackie talked about this after his death, his curiosity, his interest in the world and, and what made people tick. Uh, so the young JFK is, I think, a more serious, more engaged individual than we have come to believe. We've already uh, talked about this. I'll also say, I think maybe I upend a myth which is that the illnesses which were real uh, some of them ill diagnosed but nevertheless you know he felt them uh, i think i upend the the notion that they were acutely debilitating um, or let me put it this way this is a guy who despite these illnesses from a young age was extraordinarily active uh, and he served in the war. He had to sort of fudge to get into combat, but with his father's help, he, he did. Who runs this bruising campaign in 46, where he outworks everybody. He often sleeps only three or four or five hours a night. Somehow this guy who's supposed to be uh, on at death's door all the time and supposed to be um, so ill that he can barely function, he's able to do these things. And so maybe I suggest that um, we shouldn't exaggerate the scope, the importance of those uh, of those illnesses. I'm not sure if that's quite where the question was going, but th those are a couple things that come to mind. This is a question about what he knew about his own country. Um, he seemed to know Europe mm -hmm. and the South Pacific um, deeply from personal experience. But as far as America goes, he knew Brookline, he knew Riverdale, he knew Harvard, he knew Palm Beach. Did he know much about the country? The question is, what can you tell us about how much JFK knew about the vast nation that was the United States? And is it possible to know some of his views on um, our diversity, at, on the American people in all their diversity at this stage of his life? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think it's pretty limited, his knowledge, maybe even his interest to some extent. Mm -hmm. He had not, for example, traveled much in the South. 
uh, before he uh, became uh, uh, even a senator, so never mind in the House. Uh, and I write about the, uh, the, the, the small number of, say, African Americans, for example, that he uh, interacted with. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe he was personally prejudiced, really. Um, but it's also true that he, didn't re he wasn't really animated by the searing experience that uh, African Americans had, uh, and there was ample evidence all around them. I think that comes later, and I'll talk about this in volume two. Mm -hmm. I also would say that it's when he runs for president in 1960, and he goes to places like West Virginia, and he goes to other parts of the country that he hasn't seen before, and he sees um, the, the degree to which there are deep uh, income disparities in the country that I don't think he had fully uh, grasped before, thought about before. Uh, I think it's clear from lots of evidence, contemporaneous evidence, that West Virginia in particular uh, made a huge impression on him, what he encountered, and, and he came to appreciate the people that he met there and got a chance to talk with them. Um, mm. I don't think that was so evident before, um, I think when, and we'll see whether I can develop this early in volume two, but again, traveling around the country for the first time, really, he is seeing lots, lots yeah. of parts of the city I haven't seen before. And it's interesting that it was a book and really a book review that brought um, hidden poverty to his attention in a big way. Michael Harrington's The Other America and then Dwight McDonald's review in the, in the New Yorker. So that's yep. that's how a cerebral, detached, non-populist, yep. non he was not a populist. Not a populist. And, and, you know, you could compare him to FDR and say they were both patricians. Um, they both suffered debilitating illnesses that made them better people and maybe better politicians. But somehow, maybe because his career coincided with a period of prosperity rather than the Great Depression, JFK was not, um, that wasn't what animated him. No, I, I think yeah. it's true. And I'm glad you raised that because we haven't really talked about the two of them in, in that way. And I think, I think I suggest somewhere in the book that he was never, what's the word? He was never really engaged by the FDR phenomenon. He never connected with him in some way that a lot of other people did. Right. I think it's, it's extraordinary the degree to which the Kennedys were insulated from the Great Depression. Rose Kennedy said later in life that one of the best periods of her life, in terms of her marriage and so on, was the early 1930s. Mm. That gives you a sense of how the Kennedys didn't experience this. And I think you're quite right that JFK becomes of political age after this, it's a result of the war and the aftermath. Yeah. And that's, and he doesn't see things in the same way that FDR does. Right. Um, this question is uh, today when the need for public service and commitment to democracy and courage feels so great, what of young Jack leaves you hopeful that today's emerging generation can rise to make an impact? Yeah. I am hopeful. Uh, I do think that. Um, that our younger generation can, I, I, my own kids are an example of this, but also others can, can do this. I do think we need desperately for Americans to re-engage with civic life, and we all need to do this. And I think that the example of Jack Kennedy and even a young Jack Kennedy uh, helps us to do this. I hope this comes out in those chapters of the book. I am struck by the degree to which in the mid 19, or maybe the, the 1936, 37, 38, when he's an undergraduate, he's asking large questions about the survival of democracy. Is democracy suited to this age, responding to the authoritarian threats? Uh, can we do this? Are there leaders who will, 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 will grasp the nettle? Uh, and, and, and accomplish this. And he's asking that even as an undergraduate. And the thesis, um, it's in some ways that that's the heart of the thesis. Why were, were the British under Baldwin and Chamberlain seemingly unable to prepare for war? But it's ultimately, I think, a hopeful message. And I guess this is, comes back to the question that I think he decides that democracy um, 
It requires able leadership. More than that, it requires citizens who are informed, who uh, take an interest in policy issues, who hold their uh, leaders accountable, and then for people themselves, of course, to enter public service and be engaged. That's, it seems to me, the, yeah. the, the most powerful part of the legacy. That's really well said, and it connects to a question that just came in from a 20-year-old university student interested in a career in the political world. What can I learn from a young JFK and his activities and attitude to self-learning and ambition? So those are two interesting um, terms that both apply to Kennedy. Yeah. Self-learning and ambition. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's perfect because he comes, he commits himself to that. It's hard to say exactly when he does. When he comes back uh, after this great excursion that you talked about, George, in 1939, uh, he's in some ways, I think, different. I think that senior year of college, uh, we see that self uh, self motivation and that determination to succeed. Um, uh, and he becomes much more ambitious. Mm -hmm. uh, ambition has to be a part of this, no question about this. But I do think that it's about, to respond to the question, it's an excellent question from our 20-year-old friend, it's about taking an interest in policy, which it sounds like you already have, in public service, in seeing how we can make things better. Uh, Jack Kennedy says in one of his papers, I think he's a junior when he, he writes this, um, for democracy to survive, it requires dedicated and capable leaders. I have that slightly wrong. It's in the preface, actually. Mm -hmm. It should have checked before we came on. But that, it seems to me, is what you and others your age should think about, um, because I think democracy is under threat. Uh, I'm worried about the, 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 the current state of it. And I think it's going to require all of us, but maybe especially your generation, to commit yourself to the hard work involved in this. I have no doubt that democracy um, can work. It has worked for this country and for other countries. Um, and then I've, I'll say one other thing, which maybe is controversial. It shouldn't be. And I guess it's an argument for, if not maybe necessarily centrism, it is an argument for remembering to treat political opponents as adversaries and not enemies. And I think that's something that Kennedy committed himself to. It's seeing the merits of the arguments on the other side, which is really hard for all of us. You know, don't get me wrong. That was I exactly think it's really crucial. I was gonna make the exact same point, Fred, because we now live in a political and media world where you are rewarded for um, the instant victory and for wiping out your opponent um, and for humiliating them, really, yeah. uh, on Twitter and anywhere. And what is the point? What, yeah. who, what does anyone gain from that? Yeah. And as a journalist, I think there is a connection to politics in that you always benefit from going out and talking to people whose experience is different from yours yeah. um, and whose views are different from yours. Yeah. And just try to understand them. Try to hear them. You don't have to like it. You don't have to be friends. You don't have to approve of their views, but you really do need to make that effort to understand them. This is something Obama has said, yeah. and he's probably the most Kennedy-esque president we've had um, yeah. since Kennedy. Try to walk around in somebody else's shoes, and then you will be able to be a better um, public servant and, and a yeah. better person. I, I, th I think that's exactly right. I think that... Um... I, I think that Joe Biden uh, at least has talked in similar terms, uh, and he was criticized earlier this year from his then primary opponents for this suggestion yeah. uh, that that ultimately we are going to have to 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 reach out and we are going to have to bargain hard, not abandon our principles, but we're going to bargain hard, and I think it's essential. I'll say also just a totally fascinating conversation mm -hmm. to me that I talk about in the book is I think in 55, between JFK and his good friend, an Englishman named David Ormsby Gore, who mm -hmm. in the Kennedy administration becomes Britain's ambassador to the United States. So they're friends right to the end. But you know, JFK says in this conversation, uh, 
I don't know if I'm cut out to be a politician. Yeah. Because I too often see the merits of the argument on the other side. I too often uh, uh, therefore become a little bit uncertain about the arguments on my own side. It's, an, it's a very revealing conversation. And as you say, George, in, in our day and age, we don't talk in those terms. Right, exactly. It'll be interesting to see if Biden, <clears throat> my analogy for Biden is much more LBJ because he is yeah. a creature of the Senate. He is a career Paul. He's a wheeler dealer. He's a centrist. And yet he's coming in, if he makes it, at a moment when history may actually make him a really consequential president. So yeah. that's my little historical analogy yeah. for the, the election and the moment that we're in right now. Um, so one, one audience member wants you to talk about his superb sense of humor, hmm. which we haven't talked about, but it really runs all through this book in his letters and scenes and quotes. So to say something about that, what kind of humor was it? Um. Yeah, it's 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 true. I, I I quote in an end note. I maybe should have it in the text, but I have Conan O'Brien, uh, who has a marvelous little essay about JFK's sense of humor. Um, but O'Brien says we've had exactly two truly funny presidents: uh, Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. I think he's right about that. Actually, mm -hmm. it doesn't it's not to say that other presidents haven't had a sense of humor. But uh, it's not been as as well developed as we see with with these two. I think it's um, it's an ironic sense of humor. It's a, it's a kind of self-deprecating sense of humor, which I think he used to great effect. Uh, maybe especially in the White House, I think he honed this particular skill. You see it to some extent earlier too, and there was a kind of absurdist quality to it at times as well. Uh, maybe in part, I'm sure this is inborn. Uh, people can probably who who know more about this than I do can can explain it. So it's partly, I'm sure, inborn. It may also have something to do with these maladies that he had, uh, and that poking fun at them and not taking himself too seriously um, uh, made sense. Was also a winning strategy. People liked it. Um, I, I can't fully explain where it came from, but there's no question that it's there and it's key to under uh, key to understanding them. We didn't talk about Bobby, but one, two questioners are interested in mm -hmm. when did Jack see Bobby's political talent and what did Jack think of Bobby's uh, work for the McCarthy committee um, alongside Roy Cohn? Yeah. I think he saw, he certainly saw Bobby's worth as a political strategist, as a campaign manager, yes. as somebody to run a campaign he saw in spades in 52. The campaign kind of is floundering against Henry Cabot Lodge. It looks like he's going to lose or at least is not well positioned. And then this 26 year old comes on, uh, Bobby, uh, and in part because he's quite a lot like the old man, uh, just gets the thing right on track. And I think it's hard to overstate how important Bobby is as a, as a, as a manager and as a uh, as a shrewd and ultimately kind of ruthless uh, operative. When he sees Bobby's potential as a politician is a more interesting question. Um, I don't know that I have a good answer to this. Mm -hmm. I think he saw, became very devoted to his brother. The age gap was such that when they were young, they were not particularly close. There's a, a trip in 51, which I write about to the Far East, including Vietnam, which they become much closer. Right. Um, but I think he, he, he deeply admired his brother and I'm sure saw that, hey, this is a guy who at some point should run himself for office. Um, how he felt about Bobby's devotion to McCarthy and his service on McCarthy's committee, I think that early on uh, he was very much inclined to let Bobby do what he felt like he should do. And it was a good career move for Bobby. The father wanted Bobby to have that position. I think as McCarthy became more controversial and it started doing more and more outrageous things. I think it became a problem. By then, Bobby's no longer in McCarthy's um, employee, if we put it that way, but he was still very close to Joe McCarthy. Mm -hmm. That creates more problems, I think, for Jack politically. But, you know, this is a very close-knit family. This is not a family that, that screams and yells at each other. Uh, and so you don't see, at least in the records that I've seen, any particular 
uh, anger on Jack's part about that continued loyalty on Bobby's part to McCarthy. And let's end with this rather enigmatic question. I sense that the majority of JFK's thoughts and ideas were never vocalized or discussed by him. Put another way, a lot of his thinking remained unrevealed. Therefore, there's a lot about JFK, the real man, his thoughts and ideas that are a mystery and that we will probably never know. Do you agree or disagree? And this gets to that question we talked about at the very start about how a biographer yeah. can have access to the inner life of, uh, of a real person who yeah. died um, 60 years, almost 60 years ago. Yeah, I think it's a very perceptive question. Uh, and I do think that he does keep a part of himself uh, secret. I, I, I think we all do, but maybe he does it a little bit more than some. He's, he's his mother's son in this regard uh, because uh, Rose, very prolific in her letter writing, at least I found, and there of course have been excellent biographies of Rose, so her biographers may disagree with me, but I find her, even with her letter writing and the voluminous correspondence, uh, kind of hard to, 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 to penetrate in this, regard. And I, in, this, in this regard. And I think there's some of that with, with JFK, but I still believe, as I said, I think when we started, maybe this is a good place to end. I think we can get to know J Jack Kennedy. Um, at various points in this story, in volume one, he writes a lot uh, and I think is quite open in what he says in these letters, including sometimes about himself, letters to, to his friends, maybe in particular Lem Billings, but also others, the letters to, to Inga Arvad, the communication between the two of them, uh, I think reveals a lot. It's gonna be interesting in volume two he will um, be more he will be more guarded because he will I be I think he will be more guarded. In fact, I already know George that uh, you know letters plain old letters written by him to others become more scarce. Yeah. Um, and so that's going to be a challenge. I think it's less uh, it, it surprised me the degree to which I felt like I could get at the young JFK. Are there people still alive who were adults uh, when he was alive and who can tell you their firsthand experience or has that generation pretty much disappeared? I, it's pretty much gone. Uh, there mm -hmm. are a few uh, and I've spoken to some of them uh, and uh, some of the ones that I spoke with, the late Richard Goodwin, uh, the late Dan Fenn um, uh, are no longer uh, with us. I, I don't think there are many. I do think that the, the magnificent JFK Library oral history collection, though it has to be used with caution, as mm -hmm. all such collections uh, must be used with caution, I think it is, is a great resource. And some of those interviews were conducted soon after the assassination, which is both a good thing and a yeah. problem. But I will rely more on those, sadly, than on being able to talk with people face to face. Well, I can't wait for the next one. But meanwhile, congrats on a marvelous book that uh, I wish all the success in the world. Um, may it reach um, many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of readers. <laughs> and, and I want to thank the JFK Library and our audience for joining us tonight. And, and most of all, Fred Logoval for being uh, you know, one of the really great historians and writers uh, in America today. Well, thank you, George, to have this opportunity with you, um, given your work. Um, and, you know, if you have not seen folks, if you have not read Our Man, you've got to get your hands on that book. Uh, George's recent writings in the Atlantic are a must read. It's been great to chat with you tonight. Uh, I, too, want to thank the library. Um, many folks in the library are thanked in my acknowledgments. Uh, I could have said much more there, but now we just need the doors to reopen so yeah. that some of us uh, can get back into those marvelous collections. Okay, good night, everybody. Take care.